Hey friend, it's Pastor Kyle with Common Grace. I wanted to share a devotion for you on this New Year's morning. So grab a cup of coffee, settle in. We've got a song, a prayer, some scripture, reflection, and another song. I'm so grateful that you're here and happy 2023. God rest you merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born upon this day. Save us all from Satan's power when we are gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father, this blessed angel came. Certain shepherds brought tidings of the same How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy Oh, tidings of comfort and joy Friends, would you just uh, take a moment to take a deep breath? <sighs> and let's pray together. Good and holy God, as we move into this new year, we can't help but stop and pause and look back. Over the last year, if we're honest with ourselves, you have guided us in the midst of mountaintops and valleys. Uh, we've been surprised, surprised by grace, uh, surprised by other things as well, things that didn't go the way that we wanted and that we hoped, relationships that haven't worked out the way that we planned, new beginnings that we thought would come and ones we weren't ready for. God, as we look back on the last year, our hope and our prayer is that we can see you at work in the midst of all of that that we can say with confidence, maybe not this day, but maybe in a day to come, that when we look back on where we have journeyed, you have been there. We've seen your hand at work. We felt your presence. We've experienced you in the gift of community. 
God, likewise, in this year to come, we pray for the same thing, that as we move, we would uh, be in your work, in your ministry, in the work of reconciling the world uh, through Jesus Christ, through the power of Jesus Christ at work in us, that we would get to participate in that work that you have going. God, that as we journey through the good and the bad, through the certain and the unknown, through the joys and the triumphs and the questions and the frustrations and the disappointments and the griefs and the losses, all that 2023 will bring, we may be aware of your presence and your spirit in our midst. God, bring us to wholeness and healing and help us each and every day to reflect your love and your grace to everyone that we meet. May this be our prayer for the year to come. Amen. Well, friends, this morning, as we kick off a new year, I want to talk a little bit about resolutions, about repentance, and about reconciliation. Uh, this is sort of based on something that I wrote a few years ago that I stumbled upon recently and, and have been wrestling with over the last couple of weeks, and I wanted to share it with you this morning. So we're right here at the new year, and, and I think um, this whole new year is really interesting. This idea, this thing that we have celebrated in the last couple of days, I remember probably the first time that I was able to stay up for New Year's uh, to, to watch the clock count down. I was probably six or seven. My mom popped popcorn. Uh, we watched the clock turn to 12. We probably had uh, the TV turned on and celebrated. And then I went to bed. And I remember thinking that was so interesting and so fascinating. And it was like a rite of passage to be a part of that. I remember uh, Y2K. Do you remember that? I, I think I, I would have been about 10 years old at the time, maybe. Uh, the, the crazy stories, though, that I can remember, even being that young, of how everything was going was gonna to blow up or, or fall apart or, or the world was going to end or something like that as we moved in, into the 21st century. I, I remember all of that, and I remember staying up that night as well and watching the clock change. And even though my parents had assured me that nothing would happen, I remember holding my breath in that moment. In more recent years, I've got to spend uh, New Year's Eve into New Year's Day all over the place. I did New York City one year, and let me tell you, it looks a lot more fun on TV than it does if you're actually there. Uh, it was cool to be there, but but uh, it, it was... It's, it's a lot more work, I guess, than you would think it would be. Uh, I also have done New Year's in the Little Apple in Manhattan, Kansas. In fact, one year with two of my friends, I got to help DJ a, a New Year's party that was in the streets. That was a, a blast, and I remember that so well. I've done uh, New Year's in Palestine uh, in the Middle East. I've done New Year's in Atlanta in some middle-of-nowhere town in Arkansas. I also got to do New Year's in New Zealand, which is the land of the first light. It's the first place where a new year comes in uh, because it's right on the international dateline. Uh, that was the beginning of 2020, which seemed like it was off to a great start. It turns out it was not, but I did get to do New Year's there. So every time I've been a part of this from halfway around the world uh, to here in Kansas City or in Wichita or in places that I've lived, I'm always fascinated by the hype and the jubilance that the new year brings. It's become a sort of a thing, I guess. And so I want to talk about one of our culture's favorite things when it comes to New Year, besides the champagne, and that is resolutions. I want to talk a little bit about resolutions. And so as we begin, I guess I just have a question. Do you have any resolutions for this year? Are you, are you thinking about them? Are you considering making them? Have you written them down? Are, are you ironclad that this is what you're going to do? Or, or do people even do that anymore? Are resolutions passe these days? Have we given up on that? Um, do, you, do you have some plans to make one? Perhaps, maybe, you would for just a moment. I want you to think uh, about the best and the worst and the most crazy resolutions you've ever made. And it doesn't have to be a New Year's resolution, by the way. We make resolutions at all sorts of times. We do it uh, when we experience a grief or a loss or we find ourselves hitting a rock bottom. Uh, we do it in joyful moments. We do it when we move to a new job, to a new school, to a new place. What are the the best and the worst and the craziest resolutions that, that you have made in your time. When you think about those resolutions, does it make you feel a little bit anxious? 
I, I wrote these down one time and I'll tell you that, that I felt very protective of the list. Like as I was writing it, I was in a group and it was like, I didn't want anybody else to see that. Why is that? I, I think part of the reason is because we would have to admit that we failed on some of them, that they didn't come to fruition. They didn't end up like we thought. We hate admitting that. So here's this thought that I had. If, if you think back through the last year and, and you just sort of thought about a timeline, January, February, March, April, all the way through 2022. And if you just drew a, a line of, of the best moments of the year and the lowest moments of the year, what I just said in the, the prayer of the mountaintops and the valleys and the in-betweens, what, what would your little graph that you created look like? Where would be the peaks? For me, it would most certainly be when uh, Hope and I welcomed our child into the world, June 23rd. Where would the valleys be for you? And where were the times that were somewhere in between? I ask that question because when I think about resolutions, I've always wrestled with this idea of, are our resolutions intended to, to move us to mountaintops or simply to avoid the valleys? Do we make resolutions so that, that things go well and they're awesome and they're wonderful? Or do we do it just to, to avoid pain and frustration and struggle and difficulty? I don't think there's a right answer. And when I've had this conversation with people before, it seems like different people have different answers. I wonder what the answer is for you when you make a resolution, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Is it about making things good and beautiful? Or is it simply about avoiding some sort of pain, addressing some sort of struggle? All of this makes me think about repentance. I bet you didn't see that transition coming. I was reflecting this year uh, about uh, resolutions again and about what, what this means for us. And that brought me to the idea uh, of, of repentance. And so I want to talk about that for just a moment. We'll leave repentance alone or uh, resolutions and we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, there's a lot in the Bible about repentance, but there's not anything in the Bible about New Year's resolutions. Uh, but we have some paradigms that we can look at when it comes to repentance. And we have something to learn. And, and so repentance is something that, that I think we need to wrestle with more because I don't think we have our minds wrapped around it. I, I think I even have a, an academic understanding, but I'm not sure that I have a, a, a guttural in my bones sort of understanding of it. There's plenty of places we can find examples of repentance and, and models of it in our scriptures. So I think about in 2 Samuel chapter 12, if you remember, David takes Bathsheba uh, and, and sleeps with her while Uriah is out at war. And then uh, when it finds, he finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant, he ends up killing Uriah. There is this story where Nathan the prophet comes to David and and he gives him this parable about uh, this man who has all the sheep and takes one sheep from a poor farmer. And David says, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says, you are that man. You have done that thing. And it moves David into a place of repentance. It's a, it's a raw, messy, painful, gross, sad story to read. But it talks about repentance in a way that I think reflects real life. There are other examples. You can uh, read Psalm 51, which talks about being washed white as snow, or you can listen to John Foreman's interpretation of it in song. It's a, it's a beautiful song. I think of Jonah and the people of Nineveh. Jonah, who, who himself repents because he runs away and then he has to turn in another direction to come back to go to where God has called him to. And I think about the people of Nineveh who were living in sin and the book of Jonah says that they repent. I also can't think about repentance without thinking about the story of the prodigal son who leaves and goes. And when he hits rock bottom, he decides to turn back. He practices his speech all the way home. And what does the father say at the end of the story? The son of mine who was lost has been found, who was dead is now alive. And friends, that's what we're talking about. Repentance. It is about turning around, but it's also about turning from what is dead and into life. That's the depth of what we're talking about. I, I have this theory that the reason that everybody gets psyched up for the new year and for resolutions, uh, part of it is because uh, resolutions are like a de-religiousified, I don't know if that's a word, version of repentance. And it's just the first step 
of repentance or one step of repentance. And in many ways, I think these are related and we feel much more comfortable with the idea of resolutions than we do of repentance. You see, there, there are things that we have to do in repentance that we don't have to do for resolutions. Uh, resolutions, we don't have to really confess to even ourselves, though sometimes we do that anything is wrong. We can just say we're trying this new thing. Repentance requires us to acknowledge that something is wrong, that we have wronged somebody, that we're going in a wrong direction and that we have to turn from it. There's no accountability with resolutions. It's all about us. It's what we do. It's our work. And then we feel shameful. We hide it when we don't meet it. We get to keep it a secret. There's no accountability in the midst of it. Repentance requires us to, to often say to somebody else or to say to God what it is that, that is mistaken or wrong or broken. And we don't have to do that with repentance. It's like the second step without having the first step that makes us uncomfortable. And I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I just realize that we feel more comfortable with resolutions than we do repentance because it's something that we can do all on our own. And I think we would do well to wrestle a bit more with repentance. Okay, so we've talked about resolutions and we've talked about repentance. I want to leave those aside for a moment and I want to talk about reconciliation. Reconciliation is a word that I like. See, reconciliation uh, really uh, can mean two different things. At a base level, uh, where we feel comfortable, uh, reconciliation is what we do when we balance our checkbook, if you still have one of those. Uh, it's an accounting term. It's, it's a setting things uh, right. It's making things right between two people. We say uh, that when two people who were estranged uh, come and confess and talk to one another and get right again, we say that they've been reconciled to one another and we celebrate those stories and we love those stories and they move our hearts. It's about, it's about harmony happening. It's about shalom happening. And so there is, there is that sense. There is also a, a very specific Christian religious sense. Reconciliation is a religious -y word that we use uh, and we say th that that is what God has done through Jesus Christ, has reconciled the world to God's own self. That's part of what we celebrate in the Christmas season is the beginning of this work of reconciliation that happens through Jesus. And, and, and certainly we participate in the ministry of reconciliation and we can be reconciled to God. But part of the reason I realize that I like the word reconciliation is because first and foremost in the religious sense, it's about what God does and what God has already done. And then only secondarily is it about my response. And so 2 Corinthians talks about this. This is a scripture that I would invite us to sit with uh, perhaps over the next week. Uh, we'll begin in uh, chapter 5, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians and read uh, a, a little bit. So, so hear these words. I'm sorry, we'll start in 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. But if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but live for the one who died and who was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer that way. So if anyone is in Christ... They are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us, the church. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. I love this calling and this ministry. I love this reminder that, that first, it is about what Christ, what God has done in Christ. And secondly, that we're called to participate in this ministry of reconciliation as followers of God and as the church. And here's the deal, friends. Sometimes we do that really well and sometimes we don't. 
There is this book that I find fascinating called Broken Churches, Broken Nation. It's by uh, C.C. Goen, and what he, uh, what he chronicles is leading up to the, the split of the North and the South in America pre-Civil War, he talks about the split of the Methodist Church as the straw that broke the camel's back as the indication in which there was no going back. And I believe there is a quote from uh, somebody on the floor of, of the House or the Senate who says that if the church can't figure this out, this issue of how to live together and have disagreement uh, about this issue, this how, how, how to be one and unified, if the issue of slavery is so divisive that the church can't figure it out, how can the nation figure it out? It's interesting because the Methodist Church has split exactly two times, major splits. There have been other, other splits over issues, often race-related, but the first one was the issue of slavery and the inclusion of black people in the life of the church and in the life of the country. The second time is the split that's happening right now about the inclusion of LGBTQ people in the life of the church and the life of the country. Sometimes the church doesn't get the ministry of reconciliation wrong. Let me give you another example, though. The, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Post-Apartheid South Africa. Uh, some of you know that I got to spend some time uh, living in South Africa, and I got to meet with somebody who was actually a member uh, of that, that commission. And he is a Methodist pastor, and I liked him because he took me to his yacht club, and we got to uh, share a meal together. I also liked him because of the stories he told. And, and I don't know if you knew this, but the reason that when that commission was created, it was headed by Desmond Tutu, and it was made up primarily of religious leaders is because uh, they thought that the people who would best know how to go about the work of reconciliation ought to be faith leaders. Sometimes the church has done this well and sometimes we haven't, but we're all called into the ministry of reconciliation because of what God has done. And so I have this other theory. I think that we can order this, these three topics uh, by uh, how individualistic they are. And I think you could order them as resolutions, which are all about me, as reconciliation, which is uh, uh, primarily about God. And then in the middle of that, you have repentance, which is relational. It requires me and somebody else or me and God. You could put them in that order. And I think our, com our comfort level follows that same order. We're most comfortable with the idea uh, of resolutions and then of repentance and then of reconciliation. I love that word, but maybe it feels overwhelming to you. We want to be in control. And as we move down that line, we have to give up more control. We have to be more honest. We have to rely more on God. If I could, I would like to introduce one more R word before we wrap up. And I know I said it was just going to be repentance and, and, uh, and, and resolutions and reconciliation, but, but all of those, I think, are about restoration. I think each one in its own way is about restoration. Resol resolutions are our work to restore ourselves to the image that we think we ought to be or others tell us we ought to be. And it's the work that we do ourselves to restore ourselves to that image. And then you have repentance. It's about restoring relationship with another person, with God. It's about restoring things in that way. And then you have reconciliation, which is about whole groups or whole categories of people being reconciled to one another, whole, whole groups of, 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 of being put right. All of it is about restoration. I think at its heart, all of us are looking for restoration. Somewhere deep down inside, at this primal level, there is something that says we need to be restored and we're desperately seeking after it. We look at the world around us, we look at ourselves, we look at our relationships, and we know things are not as they're supposed to be. We seek and we want and we desire restoration. We want more. We want things to be made new. I want us to know that as we move into this year. And I want you to feel free to make whatever resolutions that you want. There's nothing wrong with that. Be aware, though, of the restoration that you're truly seeking. Uh, this year, wrestle with the idea of reconciliation. Restore relationships between you and God. Do the hard work of restoring relationships between you and other people and let that guide you to a place of peace. 
And by all means, know that you are reconciled to God and you're called to be in the ministry of reconciliation to help restore the world to God's vision for it. But be clear, all of this is rooted in our desire to find restoration that can only come in God. So let it be known that the restoration that you're seeking is based in the ministry of God and let that guide you into wholeness in this year to come. I want to end with a blessing from John O'Donohue, who's one of my favorite poets. Uh, this is a New Year blessing. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind you, the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue, come to awaken you in a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays and the courage of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Go in peace, friends. Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house, in vain its builders strive. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me, what is your life? A mist that vanishes at dawn, all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His is above who is himself our daily bread praise him the lord of love let living water satisfy the thirst without price we'll take a cup of kindness yet all Fast life.